Welcome back. Let's finish up our discussion of data and big data by looking at some examples of how data are used today in various contexts. Big data has made its way into government, and there's a website called data.gov that was opened in, in 2012. At that time, it spanned 84 different government federal programs and six federal departments. The idea there is to help government address problems by making this data public, making it open and accessible. Uh, one of the benefits is, does government have too much data on us? Can it secure these data so that it's not violating our privacy? Another example of big data processing is web analytics. For example, the kind of thing that Google does. You can discover meaningful patterns in data by analyzing, uh, for example, the visits to a website. Organizations that and businesses that host websites are very interested in this data. How long did the individual visitor spend on this page? What did they click on? Where were they from? What age group are they in? And so forth. All of this information is available and can be processed by Google using some of the techniques that we just looked at, MapReduce, to provide customers with targeted ads. And we are all familiar with those when we do a Google search or when we visit any website these days. But the trade-off here is Google is gathering our, our clicks as we click through web pages and uh, this uh, sacrifices a bit of our privacy and the anonymity of our web searches. So Google can tell you what you've searched for recently. Another approach is called data mining. The, the approach here is to try to find patterns in large data sets. For example, uh, you might be able to take some patient medical data and by analyzing using data mining techniques divide the data set into normal patients and diabetic patients. You may be able to use the patterns that you extract from this to discover risk factors in the data. So that's a huge benefit. But again, here there's trade-offs. Can we keep these patients' medical data secure to protect patients' privacy? So these are all examples. I want to provide you know, two specific examples of problem solving that are you know, very beneficial. In the first case, this is a visualization done by IBM of Wikipedia edits. So what they've done is they've used visualization to try to distinguish certain types of editing patterns from others. So maybe we don't know the details here, but for example, this portion here may be the atypical part because it looks different from this part. Perhaps this is the editors of Wikipedia responding to an attack where somebody's trying to sabotage a page and the editors have to step in and fix it. What they found in this study was they not only could identify standard known patterns, but they also discovered new patterns that they hadn't uh, been aware of. Here's another nice example. Typically, the way infants are monitored in the neonatal intensive care unit is by the APGAR score. And for that, you need to do a blood test, which means you need to prick the heel of the infant and draw a little bit of blood. Of course, that hurts, and it has to be done frequently in order to closely monitor an infant's health. Well, Daphne Kohler at Stanford and collaborators in the medical field developed a data mining technique where they could mine heart rate, respiratory rate, and other data that were being gathered routinely in the intensive care unit and predict as well as, and even better than, the APGAR test, the health of the baby. So it's a non-invasive way using data mining to predict infant health. Our course is a course in mobile computing, What's the relationship between big data and mobile? Well, what we're seeing increasingly is a sort of uh, conversation between your smartphone and the cloud uh, where the big data processing is done. For example, I recently was making lots of use of my Google Translate app to help me learn Italian. So I would say into my app, phone, ciao mondo. Well, that would be sent out by the app to a processor online, which would use perhaps MapReduce to recognize what I said and process my speech and send me back, hello world, the translation into English. So this is wonderful. I found it very useful. It's a huge benefit if you're trying to learn or use a foreign language. But the trade-off is Google knows what I'm thinking about, what I'm talking about, where I am. Here's another example. 
augmented reality. We've seen that this is an increasingly growing trend. So imagine you have a set of Google Glass and what happens in this case is as you're walking around with your glasses on, the, the, your location is being sent to you know, Google and it's quickly looking up restaurants and other things in your neighborhood and your vicinity, your close vicinity, and showing them to you in your uh, contact lens or on your Google Glass. Well, again, this is a tremendous benefit. You're, you're going to be more aware of what's around you, including possible dangers. So maybe there are uh, ways to make us safer this way. But of course, the big trade-off is Google knows where we are, what we're thinking while we're wearing those glasses. To summarize this tour of the big data landscape, the digital era involves large data sets. It presents challenges and opportunities. It requires new processing and visualization techniques because the traditional techniques are, are only suitable for relatively small amounts of data compared to the large data sets of today. Finally, as we've seen in all the examples we've considered, the data that we've collected and stored and processed comes with the promise of enormous benefits for our everyday lives. But at the same time, the benefits come with trade-offs in terms of our privacy and security. So as citizens, it's important that we understand these trade-offs as we increasingly bring the benefits of big data into our everyday lives.